we're starting. Gentlemen, would you care to introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Israel Baron. I'm the CISO, the Cyber Manager for Israeli Railways. I've done this uh, job uh, for the last uh, year and a half. And before that I was uh, for something like uh, 10 years in the Israeli Ministry of uh, Defense. Uh, I used to be involved in uh, projects like uh, space, aviation, uh, drones, etc., etc. And uh, that's it. Now I move to the train. Great, now it's great. <laughs> yeah, always. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Miki Schiffman. I'm the VP R&D of Silos. We at Silos, we are the first company to develop cybersecurity solution to protect the railways. Uh, in my former background, I'm coming from IDF intelligence, uh, various uh, cyber roles, security, uh, sorry, uh, research, engineering, and so on. And here I am. I'm uh, Shao Vinapia. I am uh, managing partner at Shona Povi, which is a con consultancy firm in cybersecurity, uh, mainly focusing on critical infrastructure. And over the past uh, few years, I've been active mainly in the railways across Europe. And that's about it. Awesome. And yeah, you guys already know me. That's it. So let's take another baseline if you don't mind we obviously had some fun at the earlier session with anything with ships and anything with wings but let's take a look at the railway systems obviously we know some of the problems the other industries have what are you, the three of you seeing as far as the current state of railways where everything is from israeli stuff and then from the european side of things okay so uh, for the railway industry i think uh, everything is uh, let's say 20 years uh, back, because uh, cybersecurity until recently was not even a, a word in the railway industry. You know, even in Israeli railways, until uh, several years ago, nobody even thought about it. They only began to think about it, um, let's say, two or three years ago, and this was due to the fact that the, the security services, the Shabak, the Shin Bet, they came uh, to us, to Israeli Railways, and they uh, told us, uh, look, we can hack the signaling system. And uh, of course, the Israeli Railways told them, no way. Why? Because this is a safety system. This is a SEAL 4 safety system. This cannot be done. So then what they did, they uh, disappeared for three months. And they, they then they uh, returned, and they gave us a, a code, a, like a malicious code, like a Trojan. And they showed us that uh, they can move a, 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 a switch in front of a, a driving uh, train. And then what, they, what we told them is, okay, this is a closed system. How can you put uh, the malicious code in the system? So what they did, they sent uh, this uh, beautiful girl to uh, the station manager in Tel Aviv Merkaz station. And yeah, yeah, this is the true story. This is the true story. And she uh, lured him out of the, of the office. And then she put uh, this key in uh, his computer. So they showed us this can be done. And only then uh, we started to look uh, on this uh, problem. And uh, two years ago, we decided to uh, build up the cyber uh, division. And now, I was uh, in a conference in the UK several months ago. Uh, honestly, uh, uh, they, they didn't even begin to think about cyber in railways. It's, it's a very sad uh, fact. But uh, we, we are, like Israel, you know, we, we are always afraid that uh, someone will attack us. So we, I, I, I have to say, we look on things a little bit differently. And today we try to really uh, give those solutions to our systems. Uh, yeah. So Europe is kind of a different animal. Already we're hearing Brexit and all this thing. Don't know where that's going to lead us. But um, the thing is, um, you can look at the railway sector from a European perspective and also from an individual organization level perspective. What we have to bear in mind is um, the main challenge for the railway sector is all about obsolescence. Systems have very, very long lifetimes. So you're talking about something that you tender today, who's gonna be, which, is, which will be in service for the next 30 years minimum. Uh, 
And that's uh, the biggest, I would say, drawback for the railway sector. And it's also about changes. So if you talk about patching a system, well, when you have Windows updates and these kind of things, whatever are coming, it just goes on whenever you want. You decide and that's it, you're patched. Problem with the railways is if you want to change something in the system, it can lead to several impact. First one is, is the change something that can be done? So when you are tendering, you sign a contract with the supplier. So whatever is not in the contract, you've got to pay for it. That's why I was happy earlier when the, in the panel they say, I think you said that suppliers are making money, but that's true. Because everything you want to change in a, in a locomotive, you've got to pay for that. So that's one of the challenge, and it doesn't come cheap. So we're talking about making an update on one locomotive for something that's about 300K. Imagine companies which have like 1,000 locos. So maths, simple maths, it's massive cost. And uh, the other thing is regulation. Regul uh, the, the signaling system in Europe is what we call ETCS, and that's what's uh, going to be deployed in, in Israel. So it's the law. If there's something which is in the law, which is not correct, it's still, good, it's still the law. So the companies will follow only what is in the law. That is, the suppliers will only develop the system according to specifications that are approved and published. If you as a customer, in the tender you said you want something which is against the law, they will never do it. So these are challenges that we face in, 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 uh, in the railways. So it's really about uh, the lifetime of the system and how the system evolves. Yeah, sure. So I just want to add something just to put everyone on the same line. So what is so hackable about railways? Because we talk about that it's possible, but what is so interesting? What is the interesting characteristic of railways uh, comparing to other systems? So what we see in the recent years in the railway industry, uh, going both on signaling systems, which are basically the systems which uh, control all the traffic, uh, and the rolling stocks themselves is an introduction of many connectivity measures. So for example, uh, the new standards of railways, which are already deployed in metros and on mainline rail in Europe and soon in Israel, they basically take out the control of the drivers. So we talk about autonomous cars uh, in the automotive industry, but in the railways we already have a similar uh, extent of it already deployed. Like for example, there are metros in the world in which there is no driver. It's unattended already. How does it work? It works by wireless communication. How the wireless communication it works? It works by off-the-shelf communication measures, such as Wi-Fi, for example. So, for example, today in many countries, you have Wi-Fi, just regular Wi-Fi hotspot, controlling trains. So, that's... So, London, London Underground, Thales have got four of... So, in London Underground, uh, I was at the rail conference last year and Talas has deployed the, uh, some of the, the signaling systems for them, and they got a little upset when we, a uh, good friend of mine and I, rode on the London Underground. I think it took us about 20 minutes on the wireless sniffer. We got the cert that we needed and the user IDs and passwords. So if we needed to get to the train station a little bit faster, we had it covered. Yeah, okay. yeah so uh, on top of those systems, which are the carrier channels, uh, there are proprietary systems, which generally were developed for safety, as uh, Sharvin already mentioned, and of course Israel. Uh, but those are like sometimes proprietary protocols which are not exposed to any, anyone outside the vendor companies or the manufacturers. Um, and those systems basically enable uh, the center control the trains. Uh, it can provide movement authorities, for example, which is uh, the, how much the train is allowed to drive, what are the speed restrictions, and so on. So you can already think of what can it, what can it make, and if you also add to it the fact that the industry neglected cybersecurity because it was uh, entirely like dealing with safety, you can think what are the implications of such systems. So, uh. so in the U.S., in the we have something called PT positive train control (PTC). Uh, what's so from a European and an Israeli similar system? How well is that being implemented, or is that in something that's in the place? So the whole concept is not necessarily driverless systems, but a driver-based safety system. In other words, if a driver exceeds a limit, or if the driver isn't braking in time, or anything else akin to that one. 
Yeah. So b basically, um, I will talk about main lines. Main lines, what, uh, what we call main lines. So there are two different categories of system. We have systems which are for high speed lines, and we have systems which are for like regional urban lines, which is like more metro systems. So these are typically two different categories of signaling system, and uh, they use the same principles, but Fundamentally, they operate differently because they don't use the same parameters and the same kind of technologies. So um, what uh, Mike was saying and what um, Chris was also saying is what we call a concept of ATO. ATO is basically automatic train operation. So that's where you don't have a driver in the train. And you have different categories of ATO. You have one where it's driver assisted. So the driver is there to uh, intervene in case there is an alert or something. And you have uh, what we call GOA4, which is Graded of Automation 4, which is totally driverless train. So there's no driver on board. So the system is designed to be safe. Train signaling systems are designed to be safe. So basically what means is if something which is not normal is happening with the system, whether it's the uh, speed profiles, whether it's the braking distances, or even a signal is detected, it just breaks. That's the whole thing. So the, that's one of the main, I would say, elements of railway traffic, at least in Europe. And that's also one of the main problems for, for this industry. So basically, yeah, you, we have the, the equivalent, yeah. Does everybody understand why that would be an issue? In other words, if something fails or something goes wrong, the train breaks suddenly. Does everybody get the logic as to why that's an issue or not? Give me a quick show of hands. Who gets the idea as to why that's an issue? All right, those of you that don't, let's just go through this quickly. So let's say I'm sitting there with, I don't know, a malicious payload or something, or I decide I'm going to attack a train or I go after it. I don't necessarily have to hack it to slow it down or have to hack it to do anything. All I have to do is induce an error or a code or make it go into a fail state. We did this, yeah, and then it stops. And it isn't necessarily a nice stop. We did this uh, several years ago out in the US. There's a, there's a testing system and a testing station in the US. And what we ended up figuring out was we could actually make it do an emergency stop on a bend. And in the US where I live, I live in Colorado, there are lots of bends up in the hills, and they're not very nice for a train to stop on, especially coming to an emergency stop. So at which point, now you end up with all sorts of derailment issues. So making a train stop from high speed is not necessarily a nice thing to be able to do. And again, the problem is the system's designed, or at least some of the systems are designed that way. Basically, most of train accidents that we have seen in Europe over the past few years are due to human errors. So there was one lately um, in uh, two, two interesting ones. One in France, it was on a new line, a new high speed line. So basically, what happened is the train literally derailed, but it was because the driver did not observe the limited speed in a bend. So that's one of the reasons. And one in, and in Belgium was uh, actually the driver did not observe the signal. So for whatever reason, he didn't follow what the signal say. So it led to a, to a, to a, to a, um, to a train crash. I want to add on those uh, safety systems that uh, maybe they were uh, designed to be safe, but uh, they didn't take uh, in consideration that someone will mal-use these uh, functions. And uh, I want to give you an example. We have uh, the Induzi system. The Induzi system is what they just talked about here, is the system that uh, uh, controls uh, the train if it should uh, be on, uh, let's say, uh, the X miles per hour, and if the driver exceeds this uh, speed, it just gives them an emergency brake. So this system is, is critical. And after like two or three weeks uh, when I joined the, the Israeli railways, I asked them to take me to the uh, depot and see the system. Okay, so I went uh, to the locomotive, and they showed me the computer uh, that, that controls uh, the, this Induzi system. And when I looked on the cabinet, I saw this uh, flickering light. And uh, I went uh, for this light with a cord, and then I saw a, a SIM card. And I asked them, what is, it, what is this? And they told me it's, uh, it's, it's uh, some kind of a system that we did to monitor, uh, you know, the Induzi, 
uh, remotely. Apparently, we, after we bought and used the, this Induzi, which is, I remind you, a safety system for many years, someone at Israeli Railways decided that he wanted to monitor this system remotely. So what he did, he went on a tender and uh, just took one of Israeli uh, uh, technology uh, companies and they built us uh, uh, this little uh, controller that is uh, remotely controlled uh, through a GSM uh, cellular network. This is crazy. And it was not, uh, you know, it, uh, they didn't mean to do harm, but eventually someone could hack this system and like Sharon just stated, tell the train not to stop on a curve. It will derail. It will derail, for sure. Just putting up a four, yeah, these guys have Yeah, we're probably not going to see it. Sitting here, I suddenly thought, you know what, this is actually going to be fairly useful for this discussion. So this actually, in the US, two years ago, I think this is from, something like that, two years ago this is from, we were in, we were, did a little bit of research uh, on behalf of another organization. These were the 11 simple questions that we asked. Everything from can an attack cause a locomotive to uncontrollably accelerate, all the way through multiple locomotives, can a cyber establish persistence remote acted load of systems, and all these other ones. Quite simply, the answer to every single one of these questions was an unequivocally yes, it's possible to do it. And this was two years ago. And again, to your point, two years ago, everybody was like, eh, nobody needs to worry about cybersecurity and railroads. And now we suddenly realize that, well, actually, yes, we really do need to worry about it. We really do need to focus on it very, very heavily. Um, can it be started and departed through a cyber attack? That was great. This is something we'll do later on, which is like, OK, how can we take control of these things? So I apologize, guys. I suddenly realized I had this. And this would be like, oh, this is useful. So this really demonstrates this isn't just hypothetical. This was actually done out at a track. Um, there's the track it was actually done out at. Uh, all of the work was done. There was test loops. There was all sorts of interesting stuff. High speed turns, low speed turns, all sorts of other things. And the questions were basically asked is, what were the baseline cases? Can it be done? And then how quickly can it be done? And if you notice in some of those, the testing time was 10 or 20 minutes to actually effectively take control of a locomotive. Again, US-based attacks. That's like, and we talked so far only about safety systems, but we haven't talked about the connectivity between safety systems to the outside world, which also quite extensively exists. So it goes through all the parts of the railroad. So those systems which are on board sometimes are connected through insecure channels um, to other systems, like for example, the passenger information systems and so on. Uh, they go over uh, wireless channels, which are which can be intercepted in some cases. Uh, even in the backbone, misconfigurations can lead like uh, potential hackers to get from uh, one network, which is more of IT characteristics and is not uh, considered safety critical, to another network, which is considered safety critical, and in which components can uh, produce those commands, which can change the braking curves of rail of uh, trains and so on uh, and also like other cases of connectivity for example like remote maintenance uh, IOT in railways systems are just being plugged into uh, rolling stocks without thinking a lot and sometimes those systems are connected to the outside world over the internet without being like properly monitored and so on and that's like another case uh, of those uh, security threats. So the, the new trains that uh, we just bought, uh, we had a, a big session a couple of, couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't want to, 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 to tell the name of the supplier, but uh, we wanted to, to know how the, the, uh, the network is applied on, on, on those uh, uh, new trains. And they, they gave us uh, you know, a, a scheme. And uh, what we saw, uh, we were amazed actually. We had there three uh, uh, LANs. One, the passenger uh, Wi-Fi, 
The other one was the operational uh, network, which includes, uh, let's say, the, the passenger information system, uh, the man count, how many uh, men are on the train, uh, the airbag that uh, adjusts itself uh, when you sit down on the chair, etc., etc. And the third network was the uh, critical network, which includes the uh, signaling system. And all of those three segments were on the same network bus. It was only separated by a firewall. And when we asked them, aren't you afraid that someone will hack the system? They, they told us, no, we have a firewall there. Okay, so th this is the, the kind of uh, uh, things we have to deal with. And it mainly, uh, 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 we can, well, when we are talking about cyber solutions, we have to know what is the threat we want to deal with. When we ask them, what is your worst nightmare? They told us, that someone will change the passenger information system on board. This is the worst nightmare. This is not yet the case for us. <laughs> We're afraid that someone will derail us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to that point, the nice thing about having you here on the board, unlike the previous board, we didn't have Boeing or Airbus or Panasonic or Talos or anybody on the board. We have you. How are you, as an owner of these systems, dealing with this? What do you? When you're being approached by a hundred third parties and everybody's telling you we've got a solution, we're doing this, how are you dealing with that? Okay, first of all, our biggest problem is tenders that are already closed. Okay, projects that are already running and uh, people are coming to install the hardware and software. And th yes, this is, this is our biggest problem. Why? Because we can't change anything now. And if we want to change, money. And I'm talking about lots of money, lots of money, because those projects are huge. There are billions of dollars uh, uh, per project. And now if we want to change anything, you know, I have an example for you. We have uh, our biggest project now is the electrification project. It's two billion dollars project here in Israel. We are electrifying the train. And uh, when I came and joined the, the ISR, I asked uh, to see the tender. And it's not only that nothing was written there, it had one sentence that said, and I quote, data security is not <coughs> part of this project. It's not part of this project. I couldn't even come to the uh, supplier and tell him, look, give me your best practice. No, nothing. No cybersecurity at all. So this is our first problem. What we want, what we are, uh, want to do now is to uh, deal with uh, new tenders. And this is a big problem, why? Because everyone in the Israeli railway, and he has, uh, if he has a lot of money, he wants this project and that project, it doesn't go for us. We want to close those, this uh, cycle and make him that we must approve any tender before it goes out, because we want to put our uh, demands up front in the tender itself. This, this is what we can do for future uh, projects. Um, it's also very important to uh, bear in mind certain very important differences between industries. Um, if we compare railways to automotive, uh, in the automotive sector you have a kind of consortium where you have uh, all the big names for Toyota, blah, 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 they all are together and they've agreed on a certain architecture for uh, their PLCs. That's all, uh, the primary logic units. Huh? Uh, and um, that's something which is standard and goes in, the, uh, in all the cars. It's a standard. And then they make the software that goes on there. Everybody makes his whole software. Problem with trains is basically when you have a tender, you have a series of locomotives that are tailored for your requirements according to the tender, which means the trains which are running I will take Europe, for example, because you have big suppliers in Europe and they literally uh, have on the market. So <clears throat> if, uh, for example, uh, Finland tenders today for a certain kind of locomotives, it would get whatever it has asked in his tender. After two years, you have France, which orders locomotives. So if it's the same supplier, he will take the same backbone, but potentially redevelop software or whatever for that series of locomotives for France. That's where the cost comes up. So 
locomotives, when we buy, we just get a black box. We don't know what are the components on board. We don't know how it's designed, uh, what is the architecture. So that's the biggest problem. That's why if you want to do security or if you want to, make, to assess how secure a locomotive is, it's so, so uh, impossible, next, near to impossible, I would say, because we as customers have no visibility what is on board. We just get the black box. And just to add on top of that, uh, of course, like the cycles are quite complicated and tenders as well, but uh, at least from the way we see it, uh, the first question that each of those operators should ask himself is, all right, I know that there are some networks over there, I know that there are signaling systems which control, uh, which control safety critical parts. Uh, the question is whether do I know what's happening at the moment in those systems, and uh, do I have any posture of what's happening? So if the answer is no, and usually at the moment this is this is the answer in almost every company uh that's a problem because even if i'm assuming anything which is very hard to assume because of the processes that uh, both uh, Sharvind and israel uh, uh talked about uh it's very very hard like if you're not, you, you also you, you can't assume anything of what happened and you also don't know what's happening now so if you have both of those problems you you cannot in any how like in any way say that you are secure at the moment so that's in summary he say we are doomed <laughs> we can't always be doomed we're not allowed to be remember we doom and, doom and gloom is not allowed we have to be able to fix it It's kind of obvious that we see many similarities with the world of aviation and the world of uh, uh, locomotives and uh, railway transportation. Do you have uh, a way to decipher this black box locomotive, such as take it to a cyber range, attack it from all sides, and then, uh, I don't know, find out the vulnerabilities and, uh, and prioritize and deal with it? Because in airplanes, obviously, as we said there in the last panel, it's very expensive to buy an airplane, and each and every airplane is different. So it's, it's kind of an undoable for even for a big company or a small company, certainly. But the authorities, can you take your locomotive, put it in the cyber range, do you have a cyber range, and take it, I don't know, for a month, and then come up with an analysis and see where the vulnerabilities are? Because this black box is, is not good. For sure, it's not a box. I mean, it's penetratable. The only way it, or this is going to work is the supplier to to do it himself. Because we, as uh, the client, we can take the locomotive, we can uh, we can hack it all day long. Who will change it? Who will fix it? This but can it... only be done if the supplier, one of the major suppliers like uh, Tale, Siemens, etc., he will. I I I I want him to give me a system which is secured by design. Ooh. The, the, it's I take the hackers, hackers and the, the cyber range that you discussed, and he needs to do it himself. I can work with him. Yeah. I can work with him. I can take Israeli experts to come and I offered it. We offered it several times. We will come with the RNCD there, with our hackers, we can, you know, give you a, 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 a f We can do it here, but he needs to, you know, come uh, in the, how do you say here? In the, in the, pro the problem is, the problem is, it seems to be, because we ran across this in the US, is the vendor just doesn't care. Exactly. So now the question is, again, putting you on the spotlight, I'm afraid, you're the one holding that $2 billion. Why don't, is there, is there a mechanism for you to say your system you're implementing is not secure, get out? In, in yeah. my current position now, and okay. when I'm talking about tenders, again, that are already closed, yeah. it really depends on his goodwill. Really? Yeah, yeah. I should pay a lot of money. No, but, but on your tenders, I can assure you that yeah. this is what we are doing now. Right. Uh, it's also very important to to bear in mind what's the business of railways the business of railways is to run trains and carry people 
So when you, uh, what you're saying is something that we as cybersecurity professionals know we've got to do and we've, we've got to find a way to do it. The problem is you've got to need a train to do it or an aircraft to do it. If you do it on a train, it means you have to have a track, which is... But, but here's the thing, to carry people safely. 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 Or securely, it's safely. So it's all about safety. And the problem that we encounter as cybersecurity professional is how do we convince without enough, I would say, uh, arguments or enough proof, how do we convince those guys who are going to sign those two billions that before you sign these two billions, maybe you should think of putting another 500k to make sure that you can reverse engineer a train. Yeah. No, but it doesn't work that way. That's why it I should. No, it doesn't, but it should. It should. And this is so. There's. I had a conversation. There's an automotive range getting set up. There were some folks. There we are. There are some folks setting up an automotive range in in Israel. So, all right. I'm gonna have to. We we've gone over. Last final statements from you guys. A couple of a final statement from each of you. What I think now is uh, uh, what we need now is to see. What we need now is to be able to know what is attacking me. Because as of so today, only uh, IT had a uh, visibility uh, to the decision, decision makers. For the OT, for the signaling system, no visibility at all. And if I'm uh, to, uh, to, good, uh, to give a good uh, cybersecurity resilience to the Israeli railway, I need to build up a, a security operations center that will monitor both IT and OT. And only then, when I have this visibility, I know what, I need, what needs to be done. And if something happens, I need to monitor everything from the locomotive to the SCADA network and the signaling system. Only then, I know what to do. Thank you. So first, I totally agree with whatever, like everything that Israel said. Uh, my hope is that, uh, and we see it already happening, like that uh, manufacturers, vendors, rail operators uh, will start uh, purchasing those solutions and thinking about them, like, uh, and uh, and basically like securing their systems. We already see those things happening, but there should happen more. And let's hope that in, for example, the next cyber week that's going to have, we're going to have a session of more than half an hour about railway cybersecurity and more like a full session. And also like we'll discuss technical details and we're also going to talk about like qualities of solutions and not only about like awareness and things like that. There, go for it, sir. Okay. Um, I will go ba back to very, very, very essential. Uh, in the sense that we as cybersecurity professionals on our own, we are worth nothing. And I literally mean it because if we work in a company or if we create the solution, means we have a customer or we are talking about business. So if we go in an organization, our effort is to have added value to the business. That is, if it's a, tra if it's a train running company, he has to be able to run trains securely, of course, that's our problem, but they want to run it safely and they want to run it on time. So we have to, be, to bear in mind that we have to fit. Yeah, we have to fit in whatever ecosystem we work. We should not understand or be an expert in signaling or in traffic management system because we work for railways. If there is more than 50, per, uh, I mean, more than 10 percent cybersecurity professionals working in the banking sector or finance who's got a master's degree in finance, I would love to see those. So, basically, I would say, just uh, bear in mind, we have to keep at the heart of it the business. We have to have added value to the business, and we have to find a way to do that and to show that to people. Well, awesome, gentlemen. Thank you very, very much, audience. Thank you very much, some of the guys. Thank you, guys.